But even a lust for power or, or wealth or fame can be open doors that invite the devil in. I'll give you a true story that was told to me by Father Jim Labar. He was the exorcist of New York City back in the 90s. Hi, thanks for tuning in to our daily inspiration. As always, thank you so much everybody for taking the time to be here with us, where we focus on short form videos here covering various subjects on our faith. Well then, as for this video, I'd like to share something from the exorcist Father Daniel Rehill, where he shared a very useful lesson that we can all learn from of a woman who would do anything to be famous and ended up making a deal with the devil. As Father Rehill puts it, no one becomes possessed without some sort of a consent to evil. So we shouldn't fear this. We can't wake up one morning and possessed by the devil. However, if we're dabbling with the occult, well then we could end up one morning possessed and we certainly don't want that to happen. And, um... True story, there was a uh, young Catholic uh, Filipino girl who was attending Juilliard. She was, I believe, a violinist, and she was getting ready to graduate, and um, she had no big job offers, and she really wanted to be famous. That was her goal, to be famous. Not to be the best at playing the violin, but to be famous. famous. And she would often... Uh, some of the other students would often hear saying, I would do anything to be famous. That's a terrible thing to say because the devil listens to those sort of things. I would do anything, like you would give up your soul. And so one night she went to bed, normal evening, and she had a dream. And in the dream, this beautiful naked man approached her. And he said, do you really want fame and fortune? And she said, I do. And he... Um, he opened his hand and a parchment rolled out and he said um, then just sign this and then i will give you everything you want and then he cut her finger with his fingernail and he and she was bleeding and he said now sign that with your blood and she reached over and she signed the contract with her blood then he touched the contract with his finger and it exploded into flames and uh, landed on the floor in ashes. And that was the end of the dream. The problem with the dream is, first of all, it's a horrible dream. We can all see the symbolism of what's going on there. When she woke up though, here's the, the point of contention and the biggest problem with the whole thing. Her finger was indeed cut and there were ashes next to the bed. So it's at that point you need to run to your priest and confess this and 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 stop but she didn't she carried on as normal and within a few weeks she was offered uh, a worldwide contract to tour with uh, some kind of a uh, orchestra company and she, it was a very lucrative contract and she did become fairly famous in that realm of music and from there she got into uh, a jet setting sort of lifestyle and started all sorts of um behaviors that would not be considered her holy or virtuous um, and eventually wound up uh, with heroin and needles and she got HIV and AIDS and so fast forward a few years down the road she's dying in a hospital in New York City and uh, she remembers the night of the dream as she's calling it and she realizes she has to call her mother and tell her mother about the dream. So her mother hears the story, and of course, as any good mother would do, um, begins to lose her mind a little, realizing what she's done, and she calls the chancery and says, my daughter needs an exorcist. And this is where Father Labar comes in. So uh, Father Labar races to the hospital and uh, asks her to, to you know, re replay the whole thing for him and, and of what happened, and she gives all the details. And he says, you know, this is you know, very dangerous. You made a blood covenant for, for selling your soul with the devil. So in order to undo this, I'm going to have you write out the creed, you know, write out the Apostles' Creed, and then you're going to have to sign it with your blood to undo this. Well, you can imagine somebody with AIDS in a hospital, the doctors were not keen on this, but you know, she was allowed to do it. And after doing that, she went into cardiac arrest and started flailing on the table, her body just convulsing all over, and then she flatlines and she dies. Well, now there's a lot of finger pointing at the priest. You did this. This is your fault. And uh, they take this discussion outside. She's covered. 
you know, toe tag dead. Um, and it was about 10 or 15 minutes later, she jumps up off the table and comes back to life. And so the doctors come rushing in and uh, they start doing tests on her, her heart rate, pulse, all the BP, all that. And uh, eventually they do a test on her blood. And she has no more HIV or AIDS. She's been completely healed and brought back to life. That's the power of Jesus Christ. Anyway, for the second part of this video, I'd like to share something about a visit Padre Pio received from Purgatory, which I think is pretty interesting. As we know, Padre Pio is known for his many mystical experiences during prayer, often piercing the heavenly veil while on earth. One such experience involved an unexpected encounter with a soul from Purgatory. And one day while praying alone, Padre Pio opened his eyes to see an old man standing there. He was surprised by the presence of another person in the room and explained in his testimony. I could not imagine how he could have entered the friary at this time of night, since all the doors are locked. Seeking to unravel the mystery, Padre Pio asked the man, Who are you? What do you want? The man responded, Padre Pio, I am Pitro, son of Nicola. I died in this friary on the 18th of September 1908, in cell number four when it was still a poor house. One night, while in bed I fell asleep with a lit cigar, which ignited the mattress and I died, suffocated and burned. I am still in purgatory. I need a holy mass in order to be freed. God permitted that I come and ask you for help. And Padre Pio comforted the poor soul by saying, Rest assured that tomorrow I will celebrate mass for your liberation. The man left and the next day, Padre Pio did some investigative work and discovered the veracity of the story and how a man of the same name died on that day in 1908. Everything was confirmed and Padre Pio celebrated a mass for the repose of the old man's soul. This was not the only appearance of a soul from purgatory asking Padre Pio for prayers. And he later claimed, As many souls of the dead come up this road to the monastery as that of the souls of the living. Many times the souls would ask for a mass to be said for them, highlighting the spiritual weight of a mass and how it can lessen the time a person spends in purgatory before embracing the glories of heaven. Well then that will be all for the video this time. Thank you so much everybody for taking the time to be here with us. And as always, I hope all of you have learned something useful from this video. Anyway, until the next time, stay safe, stay healthy, and may God bless you. Contagious. Are demons contagious? They indeed are not. They can harass other people in the home because they're in, if they go into somebody's home, they can often create havoc for the whole home. But it's, it's not as though um, you can't catch it like the flu. If you're around somebody with a demon, certainly... The, their manifestations will be a, a harassment to you because it, it is uncomfortable to watch somebody being harassed by a, a demon, but uh, they're not uh, infectious. So you, you shouldn't be worried that you're going to catch a demon. In fact, I have several people on my team when we go to do these exorcisms and, um, you know, we're protected, you know, because we always go to confession just before and we're always, we go to mass before uh, we're at Mass every day. We're at Adoration every day. Uh, confession weekly for me. And so it's important that uh, you go in with no fear when you're uh, tackling uh, a situation where you think the enemy is present. But you have to be battle ready. You have to have your armor on, the armor of God. Uh, so at times, you know, people who live with people who are afflicted, that is difficult because they suffer. And it's hard to watch them suffer. That would be probably the worst uh, pain of the whole situation uh, there was also um a case where you know when you know the story of when uh the paralyzed man is lowered through the roof by his four friends you know so we've got the five guys one of them is paralyzed um it was the, the faith of those four friends was gigantic you know and really helped to get the healing that the friend needed and so our intercessory prayer for people who are having problems, whatever the problem could be, it could be a health problem, but demonic problems as well, very powerful 